Shalom, Israel. Shalom, Shalom, brother Nakwam. Watch me for Israel coming back at you with these precepts. Add another cold cut, giving, of course, our honor and our glory to Yahweh. By Shema Mashiach, Double honors to the elect elders of the house of David that's been in this truth for decades and decades, patiently waiting for the second coming of Mashiach, Kumalaki Washai. A hearty, mighty Shalom to all of the mighty men of the Most High God who are out there in the highways and byways pushing this truth. Magnify the ministry, presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice, and enduring our things for the elect's sake. Shalom, shalom, shalom to all of the men that may not be out there in the highways and byways as of yet, but they're working on it. They're getting built up in the spirit. They're praying. They're fasting. They're studying. They're being diligent and abounded in the work of the Lord. Shalom, shalom, shalom to all of the aqua out there, the sincere sisters out there, holding down in the households, reverencing the husbands, married or unmarried, being diligent and abounding in the spirit. Of our righteous foremothers and shalom everybody tuning in live on on this late night live wfi late nights don israel louise fambro tasia uh israel nigel blends urban brood yuri yisrael 91 shalom williams shanae shanae page we got next israel yaakov israel battle axes of the most high memphis shalom erect i now shah shalom king karath shalom king Ancients knew why don't we and everybody else tuning in and that will tune in, Lord willing, right? The secret life of Adam, the yoke and spiritual bodies, right? The secret life of Adam, the yoke and spiritual bodies. So it's WFI late nights, and we're gonna get right into it through the spirit and poverty. How about Shmuel was shot? Right, let's kick it off. Right, we're gonna dive into the secret life of Adam, the yoke and spiritual bodies. Let's go to the book of Genesis, right? So we want to touch on the creation of man first, because when we're dealing with Adam, again, we all know this, but it's good. You got brothers that are new coming into this truth. And even if you've been in this thing for quite some time, it's good to have that refresher. There's not everybody that was created at the same time was chosen, right? There's one chosen Adam out of all of the other men, right? But we're going to go into the creation of man because there's this, this, old philosophy and question about why man is created what is man's purpose why did the most High make man why is man evil why does man do the things that he does right how come man can't be righteous so we're going to go into that right? we're going to go into the, the ins and outs of man and the creation of man and what we go through through the spirit and how the most High is going to eventually deliver us from this now man was made on the sixth day right genesis chapter 1 and 26 and God said, now again, we know this word God in the Hebrew is uh, Allah. So Yahweh created Yahweh Shai, and Yahweh Shai was given a blueprint and the authority to create every angel and everything that you can see and can't see, visible and visible. You understand, or visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were made by him and for him. And he is the head of all things, and by him all things consist, paraphrasing. Colossians chapter 1, uh, 16 or that, right? So this is really Yahweh Shine, the angels who's doing this creation, right? It said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So man was created to rule over the rest of the creation. Everything that was made in the previous five days, man was created to rule over it. The beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fishes, the trees, right? The vegetation, everything is given unto man. The most I created this realm for man. Man is not sent to be in it. Like you got people saying, well, man is going to be on this planet and man is going to go here and man can do this. No, the most I gave the earth unto man, right? And and, and it's like you. And it is what it is, man. Man is not about to provide himself another colony on some galaxy far away. This is the land that man was given, the earth. If the Most High wanted man to be up there in the third heaven, like they show in Christianity, he would have did that. Yeah, in Christianity, you got all of these rappers, these celebrities, and everybody dies, and they live it up in heaven in these mansions where they play spades, smoke cigars, and listen to the damn Whitney Houston and Tupac. No, that's not how this thing works, man. That's the spiritual realm. Your spirit goes up there, 
But man lives on this earth, on this plane, this dimension. Right? This is um Psalms chapter 115 and 16. The heaven, even the heavens are Yahweh's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. You see that? And right now, man was given an earth, but now the earth is defiled. You got damn sodomite animals. Animals are extinct. You got fake rain, fake snow. You got cloned out creatures. You have fake plants and GMOs and pesticides and Monsanto and just defiling the earth, man. So the earth was given to man, but man is so wicked, they're destroying the creation and the home that they were given. How do you destroy the home that the Most High gave you, man? Now, ultimately, we know who's doing it. It's the so-called white man, right? He's the one that's adverse to the earth, right? Psalms chapter 82 and 5. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course, man. Yeah, you have animals migrating, living in different climates and areas that they never lived in, eating plastic and trash, oil spills, you know, fishes with damn three eyes, islands of plastic in the middle of the ocean, rain and acid and chemicals upon people. Everything's out of course, man. Fake clouds and, you know, everybody's bugged out in their mind. Everything is out of course. The Lord said one path on how to keep the earth in order, man. But man, really the Esau, who was given the earth, he has defiled the earth and corrupted the earth, man. Let's go to Isaiah 24. This is Isaiah chapter 24 and 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws. Yeah, there are laws that show you how to deal with the land. There's a land Sabbath. When you till the land for six years, in the seventh year, you let the land rest. There are laws on how to deal with your trees. You let your tree grow for three years. Then it's treated as uncircumcised. And then you can reap the uh, the vintage of the field. Man. There are laws on how to regulate the, the uh, animals that you hunt. Right? Seven days is with its mother. The eighth day you can take. You can read that in Exodus 22. All these laws you can read in Leviticus 25. Right, going to the tour. There are laws that show you how to deal with the, the animals, how to deal with the land, how to deal with the water, what trees to cut down, what trees you can't cut down, what laws of those are being kept in the society. So they have transgressed every law. They have changed the ordinance. When did the most high say dig up in the earth until oil come out and then reap the vintage? And then oppress man with your findings. Right? It says, and they have broken the everlasting covenant. So man was initially given his earth, man. Right? Man was given his earth to have dominion. When you have dominion, you dominion, you have mastery over the fish of the sea. So you can hunt the fish. You decide what you're going to eat and what you're not going to eat. You have dominion over the fowls. That's why people could train dolphins. These animals are naturally created to submit unto man's order and man's discretion and the teachings of man. That's why you can tame them. I'll tell you that in the book of our James, the third chapter. Man was created to tame these beasts. Right? This is James chapter 3 and verse 7. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind. You see that? So mankind has tamed and domesticated these animals. They have domesticated dogs, cats, creatures that were once wild without instruction. And they have domesticated them and tamed them to, to uh, use them as tools and instruments to fuel their society. Right. And that's what it means. You have dominion. You can take a horse and use it for war. You can take an oxen and use it to plow. And they have to follow your instruction. Right. So it says, uh, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So the Most High created man in his own image. In the image of the Most High created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, when it says you're made in the image of the Most High, we know again 
the Most High is likened or he's described as a dark skinned man, right? When you go to Daniel 7 and 9. But that's not what that image is really talking about. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9, right? So you have your likeness and you have your image, and you can't confuse them or mix them one with another. They are completely separate. Your likeness is your physical uh, characteristics. Salakia, right? And your image is your character, your behavior, right? Your innate nature, right? This is Daniel 7 and 9. I beheld to the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his will was as burning fire. So, yeah, we know. We understand that Yahweh Shai has pure woolly hair. He has the phenotype or the characteristics of a so-called black man, because he is a so-called black man. Now, when man was initially created, man was created with that dark melanin skin, that rich soil, right? Every man was created out of the soil, out of the dust of the ground, and they were made in uh, an innumerable amount. It doesn't tell you, okay, the most I just made one man, one woman. That's Christianity. When he made man, he made a plethora of men, right? And they were made, right? When you look at the soil of the ground or the dust of the ground, this is how man was created. You see that? That's why man looks the way that he does. And man is a different shade of brown. The only nation that's not a shade of brown it's a so-called white man because he was created as a leper. See these types of soil? You got brothers, uh, a lot of northern kingdoms, some, some southern kingdom, they come in this shade. You might come in this soil or you might be in that dark brown soil. So man was made out of the dust of the ground. You see that? And we're going to read that in Genesis 2. That's the likeness of man. And the image of man as man being created to be molded to the character of their creator. So part of the Mosai's image is what? Right? Let's go into the Mosai's image. This is the nature of man. Right? This is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. Right? Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry, right? For which things sake the wrath of the Most High cometh on the children of disobedience. Meaning these men who commit such sins receive punishment from their God. And the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. Because you had the church of Colossus and other churches who lived like the Gentiles, but they repented. And he put off those wicked works and it came into the knowledge of the Most High through his son Yahweh Shah. But now, ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So when you're made in the image of the Most High, it means that these things that are listed, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, idolatry, everything listed, man is created with the ability to abstain from these things, to be righteous, to be pure. You have the ability not to commit fornication. You have the ability not to serve idols. It's in you. It's in your conscience. It's in your nature to serve the Most High. You are programmed like that. He, the Most High formed your thought process and how your psyche works and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do and what your limitations are and the boundaries and how much you can think and, and what you can uh, um, receive, man. You know, it reads, 
uh, blasphemy, filthy communication. These are all things that man has the ability to abstain from because Yahweh was righteous. And you being made in this image, it means you have the ability to be pure and upright. But in that likeness, you're also a man who initially was created with these dominant genes, right? With that melanin. And melanin, you know, is uh, expensive, huh? I believe it's like 300 maybe $350 a gram for melanin. So it's a big deal. Let's go to um, Ecclesiastes. Actually, let's go to Genesis 2, right? This is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And we're going to come back to this verse. Right. This is chiefly talking about the chosen Adam, but it's also talking about man in general. When you break it down in terms of how man was created, man was created of the dust of the ground. And we cover what that dust is. That's that dark brown or these different shades of brown that soil. Right. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Right. So man was made from the dust of the ground. And like we always go into. You know, uh, the same elements that are in man's body are found within the soils of the earth. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto the Most High who gave it. And that's what they call the cycle of life. The Most High forms you from the dust to the ground. Then you break down and you die and you go back into the soil, you decompose. Then the Most High forms you again in your mother's womb, and you come back on the earth all over again, right? Let's pull that up. We we brought this up before. Let's see elements in man's body found in earth, right? Like I said, we brought this up before. We'll bring it out again, right? Just just for clarity's sake, right? So this proves that the creation of man is real, man. Right, the main so let's pull this up. What elements make up the human body? Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, chlorine, sodium, magnesium, iron in your blood, zinc, right? Slakia, uh, zinc, fluorine, copper, iodine, cobalt, chromium, selenium, molybdenum, manganese, right? Or manganese. Right. These are all elements that are in man's body. But these same elements are found in the earth. Even a so-called white man, he may even tell you that these elements are found in stars. You see that? So man is found and made of the dust of the ground. This is how man was created. So you're, you're really at one with the earth, man. You know, but Esau is not like that. That's why Esau, he makes all these barriers to keep man away from nature, these big ass skyscrapers, and he'll overlay the sand and the grass and the soil with concrete and asphalt, right? And damn brick, and he just makes a damn concrete mountain jungle and keeps man away from the elements, man. Keeps man away from water, and they gotta pay for water. The water's tainted and polluted. You gotta drive miles and miles and miles to see some damn grass. You might get a patch of grass in your front yard or backyard. But that's nothing, man. You can't do nothing with that, man. You can't plant nothing. You can't grow anything. Somebody come down. If you're in a city, you plant a damn peach tree. These Negroes are still a damn peaches, man. If they see something in the backyard, they'll cl uh, climb it and, and damn take a selfie and steal it, man, and, and go viral. You know? You can't even enjoy the elements, man. You can't enjoy the rain because it's acidic and it'll damn burn a hole in your skin. You can't enjoy the snow because it's not snow. Everything's defiled here like we went into. But man in his natural estate, he's formed from the dust of the ground. So let's read this again. Genesis 1 and 27. So the Alahayim created man in his own image. In the image of the Most High created he him. Male and female created he them. So again, men and women were created simultaneously. The Lord didn't just create one male monkey, one female monkey. One male uh, lion, a female lioness. One male gorilla, a female monkey, a gorilla. No, man. They were made in, in great numbers. And the Most High blessed them. 
And the Most High said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So one of man's first uh, commandments was to be fruitful and multiply, meaning reproduce. To the Most High, he's blatantly against sodomy, lesbianism, dykeism, freakism, uh, madness, man, right? The Most High is against that. The Lord said, replenish the earth. You're supposed to keep people on the earth. And you're supposed to subdue the earth, man. You're not supposed to just sit around in a in a, a hut all day. You're supposed to subdue this earth, man, and see what's going on and see the medicines that the Most High created and cut that tree down and use it uh, for a forest. I mean, it's like use it for a house, man, and take that gold and, and build a, a temple to the Most High. You're supposed to subdue this earth. Not rape, rob, and murder it, but subdue it. And these beasts, man. Right? Verse 29. And, uh, and the Allah Hayim said, and we're saying Allah Hayim because that's what the word God is in the Hebrew, right? To Yahweh shine the angels. Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree and the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for me. And man's original diet was a herb diet. This is what they call an herbivore. And it wasn't just man. It was lions, tigers, and bears, wolves, your so-called carnivores, and these creatures that eat meat. There wasn't a thing like that in the ancient times. In the elder world, everybody ate the uh, the herbs, man. Oranges, bananas, apples. Man knew what that herb was. Now you walk in a, in a forest or in a garden, and you really don't know what what, what is, man. Man back then, they knew, okay, that's used for a rash, okay? All right, that's going to be used for heal this kind of virus, okay? That herb is used for this. And, and they would know these things, right? So man was created in his image and his likeness to have dominion over the earth. Let's go to Psalms chapter 8. And remember, everybody back then, we'll go into it, everybody back then was called Adam. Right, this is the book of Psalms, chapter 8 and verse 3. When I consider the thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Right, I mean, man, man is not the most high, man is not as great as man thinks that he is. Right, and the Lord is about to show you about man, right? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. So man is made a little lower than the angels, right? So man is up there. When man was created, don't don't uh don't sleep on man. Man could think, you know, man can pray. Man, man is the top creation. When you look at the food chain, when you look at how these beasts and these animals can submit unto man, they're made right below the angels. They can even converse with the angels. We can talk to the angels. Or if you're an Israelite, you got angels around you. You could summon angels, you know, and has crowned them with glory and honor. Thou made us some to have dominion, it's like you, over the works of thy hands. And thou, it's like if thou has put all things under his feet. So another thing about man is he's made not significantly lower than the angels, but a little lower than the angels. A little lower than the angels. Let's go to the book of Genesis 5. Right? This Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Actually, yeah, I'll read one. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And the day that the Most High created man and the likeness of the Most High made he him. So when you read Genesis 5, it's really giving a record of what happened in the time of the creation. Right? It's summing it up and giving a record and a breakdown of what just happened in the first chapter. You know? And the first two chapters. And the day that the Most High created man and the likeness of the Most High made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam 
and the day when they were created. So everybody was called Adam. It's what you call uh, Adamites. That was the name of the uh, what the world would call a species. They would call it, okay, what species is that? When you're dealing with Esau, he has his different um, evolution of man. He has his Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus, Homo sapien, right? He has all these different names. Look at this. Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Neanderthalinus, sapiens. He has all these things that never happened, man. This thing, this never happened. There is no such thing as a Homo habilis. The Most High made man in its purest form on the highest level. Man did not have to evolve. Man did not have to sit there and, and, and wait. 10 million years, man, to start walking uh, 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 upright. Look, like, this is just ridiculous, man. I remember I remember growing up in the schools, and when they introduced this, I even, I'm like, man, this, this makes absolutely no sense. Even as a child, man, a lot of jakes, a lot of us, when we saw this, we started scratching our head and it didn't itch. Right? Because this this wrong confusion, man. Now, Esau, he'll call the highest level of man Homo sapiens, right? Homo meaning man, sapiens meaning wise. Sapio is the root word, which means wisdom or wise or intelligent, right? So the most I created man on this high level. Now, when you're dealing with Adam, a lot of people, when they look at man, they like to think man and some primitive, um, unintelligent state. And man wasn't made in that primitive state that Esau likes to portray, where they couldn't speak. See, what Esau does is he wants to take his situation that he went through in the dark ages and just superimpose it upon all of man and act as if all man was grunting and howling and, and sniffing and, and damn howling at the moon. That was Esau. That was you, man. Don't put that on us. When you got chased in the dark ages and you was living in the caves, you was homo neanderthalus, man. Now you want to take that and act like everybody was doing that. That's not how the most I made man. Man was made intelligent in the most high's image. A beast is not made in the image of the most high. It's the exact opposite. So how could this line up with the creation? That's why, they, again, they took these Bibles out to school. They took the creation out to school. They took religion out to school. They took the scriptures out to school, and they took the most high out these schools because it completely contradicts what Yahweh Bashmi Abashai has set up. Let's go to Job chapter 30, right? Let's go to Job chapter 30. This is Job chapter 30 and verse, I mean, this whole thing is good, man. Right, but I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read from the top. This Job chapter 30 and verse 1. But now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. So Job, he's speaking against the so-called white man. And like we always say, you got people saying, Well, I don't see the word white man in there, I don't see the word Esau in there. Show me Caucasian. Thou fool, you don't have to see the word Esau. Or Caucasian or Edomite, you gotta you gotta know it in the spirit. The Holy Spirit is gonna show you through uh, uh, context that this is speaking about Esau. And what is Job saying? He said, "I don't even want this man around my damn dogs." That's how vile this man is. And Job is about to break him down. Yea, where too might the strength of their hands profit me, and whom old age was perished? I mean, what good could Esau do for me? Because in old age. The old age is a time period from long ago. The old age is the dark ages. The old age is the medi medieval ages. The old age is the middle times, the midst of the times that Solomon saw. That's the old age that Job is making reference to. Okay? So in old age, they were out, man. Huh? Perished. For one and famine, they were solitary. Fleeing into the wilderness and former time, desolate and waste and you're only fleeing if somebody's chasing you 
if somebody's pursuing you, if you're wanted for theft, if you're wanted for murder, if you are looking for the city of refuge and a man and the revenger of blood is coming to kill you, then you're fleeing. So he got put to flight. And think about it. I'm getting excited, right? Why would Esau be fleeing into the wilderness, man? Not just one Edomite. Why would he have to flee? Under what circumstance are you fleeing into the wilderness, man? Surely you, have, you must have done things wickedly and corrupted things. Well, we know what he did, man. We don't, you can say, well, you wasn't there. Esau, he's a thief, a demon, a murderer, a, a robber. I want to use other words, man. But he got chased out in these mountains in the dark ages, man. You know, and that's when the Holy Roman Empire, the Moors, right? Uh, Israel came into power. You had the Byzantine Empire. And they pushed them out to the Caucasus Mountains. Right? When you look at these, uh, right? They pushed Esau out into the Caucasus Mountains of uh, Georgia and Russia. See that? And that link up with Revelation chapter 20. And here when they were in the Caucasus mountains, they were living like beasts. They were the homo neanderthalers. They were the ones eating flies, wearing their uh, undergarments till it disintegrated. You can read about that in the book uh, 13th Tribe by Arthur Kostler. These are the men that were eating dead bodies and scraping brain matter out of a skull. So they were chased up into these uh, mountains, man. <laughs> right? And Job knows that, man. <laughs> right? Fleeing into the wilderness and former time desolate and waste, who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief. You see that? So Job is letting you know that there are crimes that were committed. Now, the crimes aren't being mentioned. In this chapter, but when you study the precepts, you know the, the sins of the so-called white man. And he was driven forth. And that's going to come back on the earth. Because in Job 18, the most I said, they're going to be chased out the earth. Right? To dwell in the cliffs of the valleys and in caves of the earth and in the rocks. So they're the original cavemen. So contrary to popular belief, this happened in the time of the Dark Ages. It didn't happen and the creation of man 10 million years ago, 10,000 years ago. So this thing right here is complete BS. So let's go back to Genesis, right? Man and woman were created with intelligence, with understanding, right? With wisdom. Genesis 5 and 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and call their name Adam and the day when they were created. So everybody was called Adam at the time. The word Adam in the Hebrew is Adama, which means out of the ground, right? Out of the ground. That's what it means because man was formed out of the dust of the ground. That was the species, for lack of better terms, or the name given unto man, right? Now, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 17. Right, let's get another thing about man before we dive into the chosen man. This Ecclesiasticus and uh chapter 17 and verse 1. Right, Ecclesiasticus chapter 17 and 1. The Lord created man of the earth and turned him into it again. He gave them few days and a short time and power also over the things therein. And how long did man give? Well, man used to live almost a thousand years. The oldest man prior to the flood was Methuselah. He lived to be 969 years. Um, Adam lived to be 930 years. I believe Noah was 950 years. Lamech, 777 years. Right? So man lived a long time. But the Lord caught that few days, right? A few days. So back then, man was created to live almost a thousand years. All right. 
Some men may say, okay, man was created to live a thousand years, but no man, we, we really don't know. Man never, you know, got there, man. We'll show you why. Man was never able to hit that thousand years. So man was given a few, and it's even fewer because it went from that almost a thousand years. Like, let me jump down and show you that. See, this is Genesis 5 and 8. And all the days of Seth, Seth is the son of Adam, were 912 years and he died. So you see that man was living long, right? 912 years. Imagine that. Imagine, can nobody tell you nothing, man? You're 912. I mean, really, what don't you know, man? What haven't you experienced? You've experienced heartache, depression, heartbreak, happiness, joy, success, prosperity, adversity. You know, you done been through it all. So you got to think about the wisdom that man had back then. See, and, and this man is uh, Adam's son, the son of one of the sons of God. And these men knew all, they had to have no martial arts, war tactics, uh, pressure points. They probably trained animals. They had all probably had lions trained, uh, uh, sea creatures trained. You got people that could train falcons and eagles. And no one knew how to train a raven. No one could tell the raven when you read Genesis the eighth chapter to go somewhere and a raven to come back and land on his finger. And he could train a dove and tell the dove to go out there and the dove will come back. So you got to think about the, the things that they knew back then. They knew how to read the stars. They knew the constellations. So man was a lot wiser than what Esau gives credit for. Because remember, Esau gives this credit. I mean, like I brought out, he gives this narrative that man didn't know a damn thing. They're sitting around trying to discover the will and discover fire. You know? That's why I hate Esau. Because he's a damn, he's always lying about something. Just He just makes up stuff. Like I saw the other day, they talking about a uh, solar flare might hit the earth in three, three, uh, three weeks. Be ready. Then you got people on the on the, uh, the comment board. Oh no! Well, you know what do we do? What do we buy? Uh, you know, do I put my aluminum foil hat on? Do I unplug my microwave? Ain't no damn solar flare coming, man. It's, it's just going to burn up stuff. The the sun is in order. The sun will just flare off. And just wipes out stuff, man. The moon is going to crash and hit the earth. You got people, oh, my God, they worried. Do I call out of work? Right? Do I use my PTO? He just makes up stuff, man. He is the father of lies, right? But the point is, man was given a lot of wisdom back then. And man, if you took Seth, who was the son of Adam, and you brought him in today's society, man, he, I don't, he might... I don't know how long he would last. Even breathing in this air, it would be like being on another planet. You know, like they show you in these movies. When you go to these other planets, you got you got to wear a damn mask. Or you got to keep your helmet off. You take your helmet off, you know, you start to choke and your face, you know, kind of shrivel up and you got to put your damn helmet back on in the movies and then you could breathe. If you brought Seth over here to, to Chicago or Detroit or Baltimore or L.A., and he might die, man, just breathing in this damn air. You know? He, he, he definitely can't drink the water. Give him some of this water that you think is good. Some Fiji water. Some some uh, Voss. Uh, uh, what's that? Avion. You know? Hey, man, you kill Seth, man. Try to give him this food. He'd be throwing up. Give him a bag of damn hot Cheetos, man. You kill Seth. Because they were pure back then. Everything was pure. You know? So let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 17. Right? And verse 2 again. He gave them few days and a short time and power also over the things uh, they're in. Slakia. Over the things they're in. He endued them with strength by themselves. So man was made strong, fit. The most high didn't make man obese and morbid, morbidly obese, right? He made them strong and made them according to his image. So Sirach 17 gives more of a, a detailed 
account of the creation of man and put the fear of man upon all flesh and gave him dominion over beasts and fowls. They received the use of the five operations of Yahweh, and in the sixth place, he imparted them understanding. And then the seventh, speech, an interpreter of the cogitations thereof. Yeah, we went through this uh, not too long ago, right? Man has the uh, sense of sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing, right? And man has understanding. He can judge matters and decide, do I go down road A or do I go down road B? And he can weigh things in the balance and say, I think I'll go down road A. The spirit or my discernment tells me that things may not befall me. If I go down road A, if I go down road B, evil may befall me. So he has understanding. Man can think and process knowledge and information. And man has the seventh sense, which is speech, where they could take their thoughts and they could communicate verbally and express to one another what they feel and what's in their mind. Counsel and the tongue and eyes, ears, and the heart gave he them to understand. With all. He filled them with the knowledge of understanding and showed them good and evil. So man was shown good and evil. We'll touch on that too, right? See, beasts, they don't know good and evil. They don't know. Now, you may say, okay, well, a dog or an animal, they might feel bad if they do something, but they don't know what good and evil is. They don't know what wickedness is, the righteousness, you know? He hath set his eye upon their hearts that he might show them the greatness of his words. He gave them to glory and his marvelous acts forever that they might declare his works with understanding. So man was also created to declare the Most High's works, to speak and praise the Most High. As part of your creation, you are programmed to praise and talk about what your creator has done because you are the creature, right? And the elect shall praise his holy name. So if you're the elect, you're going to praise and say, And this was for all men. But remember, there was a chosen man, right? The chosen man was the chosen Adam. So in the creation of man, the Most High chose a particular man to rule over all the other men. See, with the Most High, you have to understand that there's always going to be a chosen bloodline or a seed line, right? The, the Most High doesn't deal with equality, even amongst the tribes. The tribe of Judah was the chosen tribe, you know? When Jacob had all of his sons, Jacob chose Joseph. And, and it is what it is, man. Man has favorites. The Most High has favorites. Read 2 Edges 5 and 22 on down. The Most High got a favorite flower, he got a favorite bird, he got a favorite body of water, he got a favorite city, he got a favorite landmass, he has a favorite cattle, he has a favorite people, he has a favorite everything. So the Lord said, okay, I have all of man, but I need one man that I can deal with on an intimate level and get this man laws, commandments, and statutes to make sure all of the other men are in order. And that's why Adam was created. Or the Adam was chosen. Now, the Most High doesn't, he, he just gives Adam the name Adam, right? But he's the chosen Adam, like we like to say. Or the, the Alpha Adam, you know? This is um, Genesis 2 and 7. And Yahweh formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So now we're, we broke it down on a literal level, but on a spiritual level, man was formed out the dust of the ground. The dust of the ground is a lower state, right? That's what that dust means. It means a lower state, right? A state of ignorance. This Psalm chapter 22 and 15. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me and to the dust of death. What is the dust of death, the lowest that you can go? When you don't know right from wrong, you don't know understanding. You don't know law, statutes, commandments. You don't know the most high, what pleases him, what displeases him. When you look at our people on crack, smoking weed, and the industry freaking off, 
they are brought to the dust of death, right? A very low estate. Let's go to Isaiah 47, right? Isaiah chapter 47 and 1, another precept for the dust. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. So the Mosad said, okay, America, you are the greatest economy of its time. You have the greatest military and the most influence, but your judgment come and sit in the dust. And you see that happening now. Look at their economy. They're over, uh, what, $30 trillion in debt or something like that, you know? Look at their, their military, man. It's full of sodomites and effeminate men. Nobody respects America. The Lord is making this society sit in the dust. Adam was taken from the dust, from that lower state, from a state of ignorance and brought up, right, and magnified and glorified. First Kings chapter 16 and verse 2. For as much as I exalted thee out of the dust, it's the Lord talking to Jehu, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of Jeroboam, and hast made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Because Jehu was a really a, a nobody, man. I mean, he was a captain in the army, but he didn't really have too much influence. He didn't have a crown on his head or a scepter in his right hand. He couldn't say go when they go and kill and they kill and jump and they jump, you know? But the Most High took this man in the days of the kings and made him a king, exalted him out of the dust like we were. We were exalted out of the dust. We were ignorant. We were fools. We were in a grave. We were dead men. And the Most High brought us up into this truth. Right? That's why the Lord said he breathed into him the not in his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. Right now, we are living souls. We know the name of Yahweh. We know the name of Yahweh Shah. We know the ceremonial laws. We know that Purim draws not, destruction of Nicanor. We know how to love one another, how to repent. We're living souls. We're no longer asleep and victims of ignorance in the world, fighting the great war of ignorance as it is written, right? In Wisdom of Solomon, the 14th chapter. We are living souls due to the breath that the Most High gave us. And his breath is the spirit of wisdom and prophecy, knowledge, and understanding. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 11, right? Revelation chapter 11 and verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from the Most High entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So prior to that, we were in a grave. We were dead. And Christianity, politics, religion, folly, clubs, we were rappers, aspiring athletes. Maybe we were aspiring to be entrepreneurs and to make it and retire at the age of 60 and not 65, right? But the Most High, he had another plan for us where he woke us up to this truth and gave us a spirit of life. Let's go to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter seven. And this was done for Adam. Remember, the Most High always, always has a chosen, right? That's just the way the Most High is, man. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter seven and 24. For wisdom, it's more moving than any motion. Because when it says it's more moving than any motion, you have a lot of spirits that move in the earth. But wisdom has the most impact. That's what it means it's more moving. It has the most influence. And it has the most dominion. And it can cause the most change than any other spirit. That's why it's more moving than any motion, any action by man or by these spirits. Wisdom, it trumps it. Right? <clears throat> Wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passeth and goeth through all things by reason of her pureness. Because you can see wisdom manifest in beast. You can see wisdom manifest in the sun and the moon. Wisdom passeth through all things. Wisdom is everything 
because the creation was embedded with wisdom. So it passes through all things. Verse five, uh, 25, for she is the breath of the power of the Most High and the pure influence flowing from the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, can no undefiled thing fall into her. So wisdom is that breath from the power of God. And this is what Adam was given, the chosen Adam. And he became a living soul. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. Right? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 45. It reads, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So the first man, Adam, that is speaking about is the first Adam that the Most High was dealing with, right? The Alpha Adam or the Aloph Adam. He was made a living soul due to the wisdom, knowledge and the, of the Most High. The last Adam, which is Yahweh Shai, he wasn't made a living soul. <clears throat> the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So the last Adam can make you alive, whereas the first Adam was made alive. Right, bear with me. Salakia, right? So the last Adam can make you alive and has made us alive. He was made a quickening spirit. So you have the first Adam and the last Adam. Now we're still dealing with the first man, Adam. This chosen Adam that the Most High set up. Now, when the Lord said he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, we covered that, right? It's speaking about the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that he was given. Let's get that in 2nd Ezra, the third chapter. This 2nd Ezra, chapter 3 and verse 3. That's what Ezra said, right? 2nd Ezra, chapter 3 and verse 3. And my spirit was sore moved. So that I began to speak words full of fear to the Most High and said, this Ezra calling out and in, in, um, in his, his sorrow to the Most High. O Lord who bears rule, thou spakest at the beginning when thou didst plant the earth and that thyself alone and commandest the people and gavest the body unto Adam without soul, which was the workmanship of thine hands. Right, because Adam was made without soul, meaning prior to the Most High choosing Adam, Adam didn't know the laws, the statutes, and the commandments. He didn't know how to please the Most High. You know, Adam didn't know righteousness. Adam didn't know these things, just like we didn't know, man. We were without souls, soulless, dead zombies in Babylon the Great. So Adam at one time, he was without soul. It doesn't mean he was just a soulless, but you know what it's saying is you can see when you look people in the eyes, they look dead. Like they don't have a soul. Huh? These guys that be doing um, uh, uh, lean, you know, uh, smoking, they be bugged out. Look at their eyes, man. You don't know, they literally look dead. You got them big, black, dark circles around their eyes, big, black pupils. You know, all these damn wrinkles and spots and demons on them, they are without soul, man. I saw this picture of um of that rapper, uh, NBA young boy. He was on the floor. It popped up on the feet, he was on the floor, on the feet. And he had them, uh, I think he had like a double cup of lean and some pills on the floor. And you would have thought this guy was dead, man. They were wearing these damn ski masks and these, these fitted caps on top. And they be doing this. I mean, you can tell that they're without soul. You know? So Adam was just like that. Right? Adam was just like that. So let's read 2nd Ezra 3 and 5. Not that Adam was on lean. Yeah, you know, he was smoking a cigarette. No, it just means he was in a state of ignorance. Right? And gave us a body unto Adam without soul. Right? Meaning Adam was up there in the spirit world. The chosen Adam. Then the Mosai sent Adam down into a body, 
but the body he gave them wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. We were all we were all given bodies without souls. You know, every single one of us. The Most High created this body for us. How your height, your weight, right? You know how many digits you have, your, your eyesight, how fast. You, everybody was given a body without soul, which was the workmanship of thine hands. And did his breathe into him the breath of life, and he was made living before thee. We covered that, right? And thou ledest him into paradise, which thy right hand had planted before ever the earth came forth, right? Meaning before the earth was expanded and populated and overtaken by man, the Most High led Adam into what we call paradise. Now, this paradise is the Garden of Eden. The word Eden itself means paradise, right? So let's read that in Genesis chapter 2 and 8. Genesis chapter 2 and 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. So that's what second measures means when he led him into paradise. This word Eden, it means paradise. I should say that in Hebrew. Aidan, it means paradise. Okay, they say pleasure. All right. It really means paradise. You, you can say pleasure. Right? Because when you're in paradise, you're in a state of pleasure or bliss. Let's see if they got on the etymology. If we, if we type in Eden on the online etymology. Okay, you see that? So they say um, Eden, delightful place. Right? Same thing. Paradise, pleasure, delightful place. Right? Uh, Aidan, pleasure or delight. Right? So that's essentially... Uh, what that word means now here's the word paradise the etymology of the word paradise because you may think paradise is hawaii um uh tijuana bora bora jamaica right the cancun right whatever wherever people spend a they life savings right but here's what paradise is the garden of eden that's the etymology that's the original thought when people said paradise, they weren't thinking about a beach on, on down Maui Maui, man. That's a that's a place. Or the jet black sand that uh, uh Joe spoke of, man. Where he said, make love on the beach of jet black sand. People I gotta find a jet black sand. That's not paradise. No man has been to true paradise yet, man. We don't care how many martinis you had, how many uh um uh, margaritas, man, you know. You had your Hawaii shirt on and you took a one-way ticket and you spent this smile and you went with your boys or, your, you know, the sister, she went with her girlfriends and they going on bad path. This was paradise. No, true paradise is the Garden of Eden. And that's how the Most High made the earth. Now, if you look up, there are some places on the earth that still kind of have that, you know, kind of feel, but it is nothing like how it was during the time of Adam. So this is Hawaii. And it hasn't really been too, it has been inhabited by man, but it, it's not like New York or Chicago or LA. So there are still glimpses of paradise um, on the earth. And I only picked Hawaii, right? Because, you know, that's the only thing I can think of. But there are other, other, uh, pops, um, like other parts of the earth. Right, I believe if you look up, um, I spelled Fiji wrong. Right, the island of Fiji. There's a lot of different islands, right, in different parts of the earth where man hasn't really corrupted yet, that are somewhat what paradise would have looked like. You know, without skyscrapers and chemtrails and you know the things that man go through now so back back in the ancient times man went through paradise right or adam so here it is right the paradise from the etymology the garden of eden from the old finch paradise paradise garden of eden from the latin paradisus 
a park or an orchard or an orchid, the Garden of Eden, the abode of the blessed. You see that? The abode, who's the blessed? Really Israel, ma. So paradise, true paradise is only for the Israelites, right? The sons of the most high God, right? Let's see what else we got. Uh, let's see, jump down, right? So it's, it's essentially just means uh, pleasure, right? Pleasure. That's what paradise is or the Garden of Eden. So that's what this means in Second Ezra. He led him into paradise, the Garden of Eden. Now, the Garden of Eden, we'll show you what a Garden of Eden was. The Garden of Eden that Adam was in, the chosen Adam, is none other than modern day or ancient times, the land of Israel, right? It wasn't some mystical place in Neverland. This is where Adam was, right? Because the Garden of Eden is Judea or Jerusalem of its time. That's what a Garden of Eden was. That's the true paradise. And that's where the Lord put Adam, right? Adam was king in his time. He was a god at this time. Ad, you know, Adam wasn't just sitting around with, like we always say, with a, a loincloth on, waiting to eat an apple. Adam was a king and Adam was a god, right? Let's go to the book of uh, Ezekiel, chapter 36. Right to prove that that land is the land of um Israel, right? The Garden of Eden, Ezekiel chapter 36 and 33. Thus said the Lord God, and the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by, and they shall say. This land that was desolate, made in the land of Israel after Amalek is bombed out that land, right? By Russia, by Iran, by uh, Iraq, by the kings of the east, and it will become desolate, right? And they shall say this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. Because that's the original, habit, uh, original location of the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited, right? So the original spot for the Garden of Eden is Jerusalem or the land of Israel, right? Let's go to Genesis, the second chapter again. Let's actually jump down in Genesis. This is Genesis chapter two and verse, we'll read 10. And a river went out of Eden, to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. So the river that went out of Eden to water the garden, that's the Jordan River, right? That's this Jordan River that runs uh, so-called north and south, all right? And it's going into four heads and other four bodies of water, right? So let's read about that. So I can... The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. So the first body of water is the Pison. The Pison is another name of the Red Sea. You got the Gulf of uh, Aqua, Aqua, and the Gulf of uh, Adan, Adan, if I'm not mistaken, right? When you look up the Red Sea, right? Something similar to that, right? So here's your Red Sea. Let's pull up, uh, let's see, map. Let's see if I get another map real quick. Map of Middle East. We'll do Middle East. And you'll see the Paisan, which is another name of saying the Red Sea. So what the Lord is doing is he's giving you these bodies of water so you can, you know, deduce where the Garden of Eden was. So you're looking at the land of Israel right here, and you see the Red Sea being one of the clues to locate the Garden of Eden. 
right? So that's the Paisan, the Red Sea. So it's giving you the region right there. And it compasses the whole land of Havilah. Havilah is modern day Saudi Arabia. See, Gulf of uh, Aden and the Gulf of Aqba, which is the Red Sea. And this compassed the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And there's a lot of gold in Havilah. Before it was called Saudi Arabia, Yemen, all of that, it was called Havilah. Right? This is Havilah right here. Right? This entire region from right here where it says uh, south of the Suez Canal all the way down to Saudi Arabia. That's your uh, land of Havilah. And you can read about that. I haven't brought this out in a long time in Genesis, the 25th chapter, if I'm not mistaken, right? Got to shake the dust off of this precept. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 17. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, and 137 years, and he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur. So Shur is modern day Syria, right? That is before Egypt, as thou goest toward us, Syria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. You see that? So the Lord gives you these contexts of where the Ishmaelites dwell, Assyria, the, basically the Middle East, right? Assyria, Shur, Assyria, Havilah is that region we just went into. So let's go into this word, Havila. Right? Let's see. Uh, let's see if they give you that. Right? This word, Havila. And again, these are ancient names. If you look up a map now, you look for Havila, it's not going to be there. Okay, you see that? Havila, a district of Arabia of the Ishmaelites, named from the second son of Cush. Probably the district of Kualan and the northwestern part of Yemen. So it's that Saudi Arabia, Yemen area. That's Havilah. So when you're dealing with one of the bodies of water to know where Adam was, you have to know geography and know that, hey, look, that, what did it look like? It says the um, northwestern part of Yemen. So when you pull that map up, that's your northwestern part, this region. And this region, that's why it says the uh, Paisan compasses the whole land of Havilah. All right. That's your first clue to let you know that the Garden of Eden is in the land of Israel. It reads, and it says where there is gold. And there's a lot of resources there, man. There's oil, there's gold. That's why there's always wars and conflicts with those people in that region. Genesis 2 and 12. And the gold of that land is good. It's not cheap gold that turned green. That you get from that the gumball machine inside that uh that plastic thing with the colorful top that you can take off. Now you know what I'm talking about, right? The land, so like the gold of that land is good. There's delium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Now Gihon is your Nile River. Right, and it compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. See your Nile River right here, right on this map. It says Port Sudan, and your Nile River runs south to north or north to south, all the way up into this region. So it's letting you know where that uh, land of Israel is. Right, so you got the Red Sea pointing to that region, you got the Nile River pointing to that region, you got the Jordan River. So it compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. There's only one body of water that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia, and that's your Nile River, which the Bible calls the Gihon. Verse 14, and the name of the third river is Hadiki. That is it, which goeth toward the east of Assyria. Now, which river goes towards the east of Assyria? That would be your Tigris River. So you look up your Tigris, that's this river right here, right? It says Tigris right here, right? So it's showing, it's pointing to this region. And then your fourth body of water and the fourth river is Euphrates. So that's your Euphrates. So it's showing you that the Garden of Eden is this region right here, chiefly the land of Israel. 
because you got the Red Sea, you got the Nile River, you got the Tigris, and you got the Euphrates. This is the paradise that Adam was planted in. This region right here, chiefly the land of Israel. Chiefly the land of Israel. So when you go back to this in 2nd Ezra, we understand where that paradise was. It wasn't in Hawaii. It was that greater region of the land of Israel. And really, when you look up the true boundaries of the land of Israel, it's a lot larger than what the map shows you today. Right? Let's see if we could just see true boundaries. Oh, man. Let's see if I can get that. Let's go to Genesis real quick, right? Just to prove that, and then we'll get back into that. Let's go to Genesis. I believe I want the 12th chapter. Right? Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. And verse... So I can bear with me. I may want 17. Right, just to prove this. Right, so I can bear with me. Right, so let me just type this in for sake of time. Right, just for sake of time, let me type this in. What the Lord told Abraham. 15, so lucky, that's what I want. So lucky, Genesis chapter 15, right, just to prove that, that the land of Israel now is not the true boundaries. Genesis chapter 15 and 18. And the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, until thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, which is the Gihon, the Nile River, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That's why the Garden of Eden is from the Gihon all the way up into the river Euphrates. So let's pull that map up again. See that? From the river of Egypt all the way up into the Euphrates. So that's why the Garden of Eden or Paradise would have had to been this region. So when you look at the boundary of Israel now, it goes all the way down with, you know, Dan to Beersheba, all the way up to Lebanon. But it really is supposed to expand all the way past the uh, Euphrates. And there are maps that actually show that. When you look up, what do they call it, Greater Israel map? They'll even give you that true boundary of the Garden of Eden. See that? From the Nile River unto the river Euphrates. And scholars call that greater Israel, but that's your true garden of Eden. Because that's the boundary that the Lord told uh, uh, Abraham from the Nile to damn near Iraq. You know? And Abraham was from Iraq, modern day Iraq. He's from Ur the Chaldees. If you get the, if you, when you go through that breakdown, you go through the understanding, he went to, uh, uh, Mesopotamia, Haran, and he came down to Canaan, and then he went to Egypt, and he came back out, right? Nevertheless, this is the greater Israel, or this is the paradise that Adam was in. The headquarters of the paradise is the modern-day uh, geography, or uh, boundaries, rather, of the land of Israel, okay? So now we understand what this paradise is that Adam was led to. Right, so geography plays an integral part of the breakdown in Genesis, uh, the second chapter, when you break when you're dealing with Adam and knowing where he was at, right? And you had other people in that region at that time. You had other nations. You had other other uh, behaviors and and men and demons and wickedness going on. So the, so Adam was set up to go in that land and and put things in order. Wherever he was before that, we don't know, but he was put in that land. Like the Lord told Abraham or Abram, get out this place. And he put him in that land. Right? He said, leave the land of Chaldea. And then I need you to go to that spot, right? That I'm going to give you. So this second Ezra chapter 3 and 6. Right? Let me see where I'm at with time. Okay. All right, we're making good time. All right. Second Ezra 3 and 6. And thou lettest him into paradise. 
which thy right hand had planted before ever the earth came forth, right? So that was the original uh, boundaries of the uh, land where man was at. And unto hell, meaning unto the chosen Adam, thou gavest commandment to love thy way, which he transgressed. And immediately thou appointed death in him and in his generations of whom came nations, tribes, people, and kindreds out of number. So the Lord gave Adam a commandment to love thy way, right? What is that? This is the fundamental precept, Israelite 101. What does it mean to love thy way? This is 1 John chapter 5 and 3. This is what Adam was given. For this is the love of the Most High, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Do you think we're the only ones that know that? Adam knew that, man. Huh? That's what it means. He was given a commandment to love thy way. Don't serve any other gods. Don't take my name in vain. Don't bow down to graven images. Don't commit adultery. Remember, he was given the breath of life. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, there are commandments that Adam wasn't given. Did Adam have to keep the day of Simon? No, he didn't keep the day of Simon. Did he keep pure own feast of dedication? No. You know? Did Adam have fringes on? Doesn't, uh, you know, more than likely not. They were instituted in Numbers of 15 chapter. Perhaps they may have been reinstituted, but there's no account. So he was given a commandment to keep, the, to, to love thy way and to follow the laws. But he transgressed, so he sinned. And immediately, there, thou appointest death in him. So the Lord pulled the trigger on Adam, for lack of better terms, and pressed the button, and death started spreading. Then uh, uh, eventually, it led to his corruption, his decay, man. And in his generations, of whom came nations, tribes, people, kindreds, out of number. Right? So Adam was, was a top guy, man, until he went off. Right? He was, he was, he was, he was a king. When you read Luke, the third chapter, and you go through his genealogy, he's called the son of God. Right? And Adam had a mighty fall, man. And we can't fall like that. Right? The Lord said, a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Right? <clears throat> but nevertheless, man, we all are like Adam. We were all formed at the dust of the ground. The Lord breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. And we can't just go astray, man. And if you did go astray, make that your last time. Luke 3 and 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So Adam was the son of God at the time. Head honcho, numero uno, man. And whatever he said, that was a law. That was a decree. And nobody can defile it or go against it. Let's go to Ecclesiasticus, chapter 49 and verse 16, right? Ecclesiasticus 49 and 16. Sim and Seth, meaning Shem and Seth, were in great honor among men, and so was Adam above every living thing in the creation. So Adam was in great honor among men, and he was above every living thing, meaning every man in the creation, the chosen Adam. Now, what makes you in great honor? Is it wealth and money and riches? What made Adam have great honor? Right? Let's get this in Proverbs. Leave on chapter 21, maybe uh, chapter 11. It's like it was 21. Here it is, like it. Proverbs 21 and 21. What makes you have great honor? He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life righteousness and honor so how did adam get honor because originally he followed after righteousness and adam's life before he went off he followed after mercy his job was to enforce laws and commandments right this is genesis chapter 2 and 15 let's prove that and the lord god took the man so going back to genesis 2 right he took the uh, chosen adam and put him into the Garden of Eden 
to dress it and to keep it. So he was taken and put in this region to dress it and to keep it. So he, his job essentially was to push this word, right? And teach the earth how to serve the most high. Like our forefathers, you had the apostles that went on uh, missions, the four journeys of the apostle Paul, he'll go to Derby, he'll go to Lystra, Iconium, right? Then he'll travel and go to uh, Colossus and these different spots. Then you had the priests, they would travel from city to city and they would teach the word. And a lot of times people would come to the king and they would hear the word. So Adam's job, believe it or not, was to teach the laws and the commandments. Adam is a, uh, a prototype of Israel because our job on the earth is to teach the earth the laws and the statutes and the commandments. Right now we're focusing on our people because we're wicked and we're off. But our overall goal is to make sure all of the nations are, are keeping the commandments. Did not the most I say that we would be a nation of kings and priests? Let's get them Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. And ye shall be unto me a nation. Let me read that again. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So when you're a kingdom of priests, your job is to do what? To dress and to keep, meaning to regulate the earth, to plant seeds of righteousness, to cut off the wild branches, to bring the fruit to the husbandman, right? It's a parabolic talk of husbandry. So Adam's job was husbandry, right? Righteous husbandry. Let's go to the book of First Corinthians. And when you're dealing with husbandry, you're dealing with planting, right? Horticulture. This is First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, right? I'm going to start at 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. And this was Adam's job, to dress it and to keep it. Same thing that the apostles did. Same thing they were doing. We're planting seeds. The seed that we're planting is the word of Yahweh. Ba'ashim Yahushua. Let's prove that in Mark. That's what we're planting. We're not planting uh, seeds of discord and uh, confusion, right? And sowing Christianity and a seed of Islam. That's that's wickedness, man, right? We're sowing the word of Yahweh. This is the book of Mark. I should get Matthew. All right, let me get Matthew. I like that one. Actually, I'll read Mark, right? Mark chapter 4 and 13. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye understand all parables? The sower soweth the word. So what do you think Adam was doing? He was the original sower. Let's go into this word sower. And he was planting the word of God in the minds of the people. Here's the word sower in the Greek, right? And it is sparrow or spiral to sow to scatter seeds a metaphor of proverbial sense because it's it's not literal you're spiritually metaphorically sowing seeds that's why first corinthians it says uh, three and eight now he that planteth and he that watereth are one when adam had to do both he was planting the seed then he had to water the seed right so his job was to labor in the garden, in the vineyard. Let's go to Song of Solomon. Remember, the Mosai's people are likened unto a vineyard or a garden. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. So anybody that gardens, you got to keep wild beasts out the garden. You might have uh, 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 your plant kind of lean into the side. You got to kind of stick it up right, put a stick right there, tie it to it, man, so it can grow up right. You might have to cut some plants, man. You got to cut, you know, the dead. Uh, I don't want to use the word dead ends off, but you got to cut 
you know, the certain parts off so it can grow, you know. It's a lot of work that go. You got to refertilize it, new soil. You got to water it. You got to you got to give it sunlight. It, it's labor. Right? It's not easy. Right. So it reads in the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So that was Adam's job to go in his vineyard where the people were and bring forth righteousness. His job was to dress it and to keep it. All right. To dress it and to keep it. So let's let's get an account of that. Let's go to Ezekiel. Right. Chapter 31. This is Ezekiel chapter 31 and verse 3. Now, this is a dark saying and it's going into Adam. Right. Ezekiel 31 to 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with the shadowing shroud and them in high stature. And his top was among the thick boughs. And this is a dark saying speaking of Adam. Men are likened unto trees. Read Matthew chapter 7, 15 through 17. Read Matthew chapter 3 and 11. Read Psalms chapter 1 and 1 on down. Read Jeremiah chapter 17 and 8. I mean, we just read Mark chapter 4, 14 on down. Right? Read these accounts where men are likened unto trees. Read Mark 8, 22 through 24 where the man said, and I see men, men as trees walking. The cedar is the highest, most exalted tree. Adam was the highest, most exalted man. So he's the Assyrian or the powerful man of might in Lebanon. Lebanon is a parabolic uh, state of Israel, right? Because Lebanon is likened for, for cedars, you know, and beauty. The waters, we're reading about Adam. The waters made him great, been in the living water. The deep set him up on high with her rivers, meaning wisdom's rivers, running round about his plants. And sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Right? So Adam's job was to water all the trees of the field. What is the field? The field is the world. Let's get that in Matthew chapter 13. So Adam had a hard job, man. Huh? He was a king. He was a god. But he was also putting the laws out there. Again, stop following the church where Adam is just a... Uh, Who did Black Adam and Eve? Let's pull this up. But this is just Adam, man. Looking like a, a, a creep. You know? Adam wasn't walking around naked, man. Adam was the most, he was the wisest man of the time. Right, the wisest man of the time. He didn't have a spear. <laughs> I hate Esau, man. Damn caveman spear and loincloth. Everybody gotta have a spear and a loincloth on, man. Adam, more than likely, Adam had royal garments on. He may have had a crown on, man. Uh, 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 um, a girdle, a scepter. But they won't show you those images. This is what they want, the propaganda that they want to push. This primitive, uh, unintelligent, base man. But how could you be, what wise man walks around with a loincloth? What wise man that knows the wisdom of the most High walks around with a damn spear in his hand with no shoes on his feet, man? With no beard on his face. Like a creep. So we know Adam had more than likely a robe on, a tunic, a girdle, a scepter, a crown. And he didn't have to walk around with a Bible. He had it all up here. He knew the laws. He had an excellent memory, an excellent mind, right? And integrity, man. He was a threat to all of the wicked out there. That's what we're reading about in Ezekiel chapter 31. Right, he sent out all his rivers to the trees of the field. This is Matthew chapter 13 and 38. Right, Matthew 13 and 38. The field is the world, 
The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares, it's like it, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So the field is the world, and the trees are men. Let's get the classic. Mark 8 and 24. This is the classic. It reads, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Because man takes root in the soil. His leaf is his understanding and his fruit are his works. And he needs living water to constantly grow and be nourished and to keep his leaf green. And to constantly yield fruit to Yahweh Bashmi Abishai. And Adam's job was to take that fruit and bring it to the Most High. Right? This song is Solomon, chapter 8 and verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. So this is a dark sand speaking about Yahweh's vineyard. The nation. And this is, you know, like Adam. Because the Mosai had the garden of Eden. That was his garden. And he let it out to keep, he let the vineyard out to keepers. The keeper in the time of Adam was Adam. The keeper in this time are the prophets and the apostles, the servants of the Lord that do the work on the highways and byways. The keepers during the time of our kings was our leaders, our high priests, the Levites, the king. There's always keepers that the Most High lets this garden out to. Read Matthew, the 20th chapter. It says, everyone for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. So this is essentially like a sharecropper. The most I leases this out to you and you receive a reward, but you got to bring an offering to the most high. Right? I just want to tell you that. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand and those that keep the fruit thereof, 200. So Solomon must have a thousand. And those that keep the fruit thereof, 200. And this is, you know, the one of the best anal or better analogies I like to use is, if you know how a barbershop works or a salon, right? The man that owned a barbershop, he get a profit off of everybody's chair. You could rent out a chair, right? And you might charge $50. Let's say $50 a haircut. That's what they do now. Back in the day, it was like 20, right? Really, it was like 15. Now it's $50 is a grown man cut, right? Nevertheless, let's say you charge $50 and you, you end up getting, you cut four heads, you get $200. At the end of the day, you got to give a portion to the, to the, uh, to the owner, man. but you get, you keep a little to yourself, but he reaps the more of the benefits. He gets the greater profit because he's the owner. Likewise, and it's true, even though we labor in this vineyard and we gather fruit and we're dressing the garden, we're keeping it, we get a reward. But the true honor and the true glory and all of the true success and wealth goes to Yahweh Shah as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's why he gets a thousand completion, but we get 200 and we'll take our 200. Huh? Right. We'll take our 200. So Adam had to go in the garden and dress it and to keep it and bring forth fruit to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shah. All right. So let's go back to this. Ezekiel chapter 31 and 5. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his bows were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. So Adam was the top man. You couldn't look at Adam uh, if he didn't want you to look at him. You can't walk past him. Huh? He probably had an army, you know. Abraham had an army. Probably had a throne. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his bows, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. So everybody had to submit to Adam. It's the same way they submitted to these kings, Cyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, our kings, uh, David, Solomon, right? Uh, uh, Abijah, or Roboam, Abijah, Asa, etc., right? They had to submit unto Adam and they had to dwell under his shadow. It said great nations. Remember on the map we had 
nations were here and they had to submit unto Adam and live under his shadow, right? They had to live under his shadow. Verse seven, thus was he fair in his greatness and the length of his branches for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his bows and the chestnut trees were not like his branches nor any tree in the garden of the most high was like unto him and his beauty. So just like now, Jake can't hide to save his life. If you go to China, you're a superstar. You go to Japan, you get all of the women. And these guys go to the Philippines, they record themselves going and doing things and they're the stars. Wherever Jake go, you attract attention. You walk different, you think different. You can't hide and you can't blend in, right? You're just going to stand out because you're superior. And that's how Adam was. No other, he wasn't like these other nations, these other trees, these other men. His leaf was better. His fruit was better. His roots were stronger. His stock was sturdier. He was more beautiful and glorified. Verse 9. <clears throat> I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So everybody on the earth, they envied Adam because they wanted to be like Adam. Like they want to be like you. Man. They want to dress like you. They want to walk like you. They want to uh, pick up your slang. <clears throat> they want to do the things that you can do. Right, Salaki, bear with me. Yeah, they want to do the things that you could do, but they can't do it, man, because they're not you, just like they was in Adam. But this shows you that everybody back then, they knew about Adam, and they envied Adam. They envied Adam, and again, <clears throat> they plotted against Adam to overthrow Adam. They plotted against Adam to overthrow Adam. They were envious against him. Right, and when these nations are envious against you, they act on it. Let's go to Psalms 2. Right, this is Psalms chapter 2 and verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So they, they take counsel against the Most High and his anointed, his chosen. And they want to break your bands. They want to break your strength, your connection to the Most High. And that's why, again, like we always go into, this serpent coming against Eve was not a coincidence. This was not just, you know, a random event. This was planned. This was strategic, right? This was by design for Adam to go off. Now, I'm not going to go through this whole account, but I do want to go into what happened once Adam went off. Adam, being his chosen man, he gave his strength over to, his, to a woman, and the Lord cut him down, right? This is Genesis chapter 3, and let's see what happened. Verse 17. And it really gave his strength over to his wife, right? Or woman, still in general, right? Genesis chapter 3 and 17. And unto Adam he said, because, and what did he do? Adam served a philosophy and a God that his wife introduced to him. Now, it doesn't pinpoint exactly what it was, but it all idolatry goes back to the host of heaven. Every God, every religion goes back to the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Every religion. Christianity goes back to the sun. Islam goes back to the moon. Hinduism goes back to the host of heaven. All these religions, man. Don't let, it, don't let the, the elephant with all of the arms and a white Jesus and a cobblestone fool you, man. These are manifestations on a physical realm of what the host of heaven is, man. Or what they perceive from the host of heaven. And they make these gods on the earth. So that's what Adam was getting into, man. 
He was a powerful man and he fell. And we have to learn from this, man. Adam was a king. He remember he was a god, the son of God. Let's go to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 10, and verse 1. Right? And we all fall short, but that's why we have these accounts that we can learn from and go back and say, hey, look, Adam fell. Look, I can't fall again. This man fell, right? Let me not fall. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 10 and 1. She preserved the firstborn father of the world that was created alone and brought him out of his fall. Right? You see that? Adam fell, but he was brought out of his fall. Because the Lord, when you go into this account, the Lord gave Adam a priesthood and a way to make an atonement for his sins. When you're brought out of your fall, that's repentance. Wisdom teaches you to repent. Wisdom teaches you to be reconciled to the Most High. Wisdom teaches you that, hey, look, even though you fail, you still have to fear the Most High. And it's going to bring you out of your fall. The precepts are going to bring you out of your fall. Right? So when Adam went off, he didn't just stay on the ground. Huh? Stop thinking Adam just went off and he just was a, 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 a duck and he just walked off in the darkness. Huh? No, he bounced back. He got back up. Let's go to uh, Proverbs 24 and 16. And that's why he did the sacrifices, man. Right? And we'll, we'll touch on that as well. Proverbs 24 and 16. For the just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Right? The wicked shall fall into mischief. So Adam was brought out of his fall. It says, and gave him power to rule all things. Adam had power to rule all things. He had power to rule all things. Right? Let's go to the book of 2nd Ezra, chapter 3. Actually, let's go back to Genesis, the third chapter. Right? Now, let's see the punishment that was put on Adam before he, was, uh, he came out of his fall. Genesis chapter 3 and 17. And unto Adam he said, because thou... Has hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and has eaten up the tree of which, Slakia, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And a tree he ate of were the philosophies of the other nations, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what's his punishment? Curse is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And that's how we're living, man. We're living this curse. You know? I mean, look at the foods we're eating, man. You got uh, fruits with no seeds in it. You got hybrid fruits. You got plum clots and... Tan uh, uh, damn, I can't even name half of this stuff, man. Tangelos. Um, have uh, uh, watermelon, have honeydew. This stuff is off. Hey, um, I had an apple, man. You know, I, I ate the apple, kind of threw the core in the ground, or I left it out, and this apple was still uh, um, in its natural state. It didn't brown, it didn't oxidize, it didn't decay. There are even accounts of you trying to give vegetation to, to uh, dogs and cats, and they don't want to eat it, man. So we we labor for the reward, not just plants and fruit and vegetables, but any benefit and any uh, reward, we have to work for it now. And we eat it in sorrow. Even if you make it, you're in sorrow, man. Huh? A lot of Jakes, you work menial jobs. You may make, you know, good money or low money, man. Right? But even when you get paid, you, you still, you got to pay bills. You got to pay rent. You got to pay mortgage. You got to pay life, life insurance. They tax the hell out of you. State tax, federal tax. You're hoping you get something on your damn tax return. You ain't supposed to be paying taxes. Sometimes you pay, uh, you do your tax return and you owe money. How the hell do you owe money? <laughs> These devils taxed you. You did them tax return. Now you owe them more money, man. 
after they didn't even tax you all damn year. Car insurance, you know, uh, house insurance. This insurance, man, is killing you, man. It's just killing you. So we we eat in sorrow. This is what happened when Adam went off, man. We deal with depression now, stress, worries, anxiety, doubt, the fear of the unknown, a lack of control in our lives, ruled over, oppressed. These are the curses. When you read Deuteronomy 28, these are the curses. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Right? Verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And even on the spiritual level, God, right? the ground, meaning the, the, the ground represents the earth where the people are. Remember, Adam was set up to dress the earth and to keep it. And it brought Adam fruit. But when Adam went off, now it was bringing forth thorns and thistles. Right? The earth now, or man is bringing thorns and thistles. Thorns and thistles harm you. They make you bleed. They hit, they uh they hurt you like Christianity, religion, politics, democracy, philosophies, the ways of man, those are the thorns and thistles that we gotta deal with in the society, right? Where it hurts your spirit, your conscience, takes your understanding away. You're, you're walking through damn thorns and thistles. And this is hell, man. You're living a life of hell. No matter what you do, it brings forth harm to you. And we have, and we have to eat the herb of the field, man. Huh? You're just living the life of a serf, a slave. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return into the ground. But out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And this is how Jake lived, man, like we brought up before. If you work in a factory, you work in a warehouse, even if you don't, you may work an office job, a white-collar job, no matter where you work. Even if you got your own so-called business, man, you still you got to sweat, you got to labor. You can't get up when you want to get up. Kings aren't supposed to work. Kings have slaves. So that you, Jake, I got my own business. I don't, I don't do I get up when I want to get up. I'm my own boss. You're not your own boss. Ain't no such thing as a, a Israelite being his own boss in this captivity, man. Because you got to pay taxes. You got to pay for your house. You got to pay for your car. You, you ain't driving without no uh, uh, driver's license. You got to check in with a so-called white man. Get pulled over without your license, man. Without some tags. Without some insurance. And tell them you your own boss. They're going to say, yeah, all right, nigger. Hands on the car and don't move. Spread those legs, man. And they'll grope you and damn freak off on you and throw you back in the damn your own car, man. And laugh at you. And they'll find you and throw it in your damn window. Write that ticket out. Throw it in your window, man. You know? Then they'll break your tail light. As they go back to their car and they say, get it fixed, nigga. You know, hit it with a flashlight, man. Your tail lights out. You know? Then you're driving away. Then they get on the dispatch and say, yeah, look out for this, 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 uh, this car with a broken tail light. He's 10 miles away. Then the other eater might he pull in. He's waiting for you to drive. Then he pull you over, man, and give you hell. So, you know, this ain't no life to live, man. You're not living a life of prosperity and his captivity. And why did Adam go off? Because the Most High gave Adam a wicked heart. Right? Let's go to 2nd Ezra chapter 3. The Most High gave Adam a wicked heart. This is 2nd Ezra chapter 3 and 21. It reads, For the first Adam, and that's the chosen Adam, Bearing a wicked heart transgressed and was overcome, and so be all they that are born of him. Now, when it says he was overcome, I mean, a demon got to him, right? A, a demon hopped on him, 
because he was given over to a wicked heart. And in these bodies right now, there was nothing Adam could do. He wasn't playing with a full deck. It's a setup. The Most High programmed Adam to go off. The Lord gave us a wicked heart, and we're going to be overcome. As long as we're in these bodies, we're going to be overcome. You're going to deal with demons. You're going to deal with lust. You're going to deal with temptation. You're going to deal with pride. You're going to deal with covetousness. You're going to deal with slothfulness. You're going to deal with idolatry, murmuring, backbiting, whispering, slander, uh, a folly, vanity, theft, adultery. Because you have this wicked heart in you. That's why we need to be delivered. Huh? Yeah, we want to be delivered from Babylon the Great, but really... When you get when you get on a certain level in this truth, it's beyond Babylon the Great. You want to get delivered from these bodies. You want to get delivered from this wicked heart where you don't sin anymore, huh? When, when you don't just go off, when you don't get tempted. We don't want to deal with this wicked heart that was in Adam. We want that spiritual righteous body. Let's go to 2nd Ezra, the fourth chapter. Actually, let me read on in 2nd Ezra 3. 2nd Ezra chapter 3 and 22. Thus, infirmity was made permanent. So you can't get rid of your wicked heart. It's permanent. You could fast. You could pray. You could work out. You can go for a run. You can change your diet. But that wicked heart is in you. No x-ray can see it. No MRI can see it. No CAT scan can see it. Only the angels can see it. That sin is deeply embedded within you. And it's permanent. And it's going to give you stress, hell, demons. Man. Next time you go off, it's because of the infirmity. When you're feeling slothful, it's because of the infirmity. When you're being tempted, it's because of the infirmity. When you get caught being angry or, or full of wrath and backbiting. Or you, you, you freak off and you still, you're thinking about wickedness and it pop up on you. and you It's because of the infirmity. It was made permanent. And the infirmity is the wicked heart that was in Adam. So even though Adam was chosen, like you're chosen, even though Adam was glorified, Adam fell and went off because he had an infirmity that he couldn't get rid of. Like a man that's blind that can never be healed. Like a man that's lame that will never walk. Like a man that's deaf that will never hear. It's permanent. Some men are they're, they're born blind and they die blind. No physician can help them. No glasses can help them. Nothing can help them. They're born blind. They die blind. You're born with infirmities. You die with the infirmity. Until Yahweh Shai returns. Man. That's why we need Yahweh Shai to heal us from this infirmity. And this infirmity is not ankle pain or Okay, I, I tore a muscle in my back. You know, I, I broke my, I have arthritis and I feel it every time it get cold. No, this is a different type of infirmity. This is the worst infirmity that you can ever have. Right? Second measure 3 and 22. Thus, infirmity was made permanent. And the law also in the heart of the people with the malignity of the root. So that the good departed away. And the evil abode still. So even when you do good, that evil still there. Even when you give alms, even when you fast, you pray, you have a good week, you have a good day, you are on fire, you are zealous. The evil is still living in you. It's permanent. The root abides deep in you. Right? Let's go to Second Ezra, chapter four. So we all have this infirmity inside of us, man. No matter if you're from the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Issachar, everybody has the infirmity, right? Everybody has this infirmity. This second Ezra, chapter 4 and verse 30. For the grain of evil seed hath been sown in the heart of Adam from the beginning. And how much ungodliness hath it brought up unto this time? And how much shall it yet bring forth until the time of threshing come? And we cover this precept all the time. We always go into it. Adam was programmed to go off. 
we were programmed to go off. Does that mean you go off and you say, <laughs> well, hey, it's programmed? No, no. That's why you have to fight. This is called a fight. Fight the good fight of faith and do it hard. It's as a good soldier in Yahusha. But we know we need the Yahushua to be delivered, God. Because in the kingdom, we're not going to have this evil seed in us. We're not going to have that infirmity. Right? And we'll be like Adam, but in his glorified estate. Let's go to Ecclesiasticus. Chapter 40, right? Let's go to Ecclesiasticus. Chapter 40. So let's see the result of dealing with this um, in the flesh, right? This Ecclesiasticus, chapter 40 and verse 1. Great travail is created for every man, and then heavy yoke is upon the sons of Adam from the day that they go out of their mother's womb till the day that they return to the mother of all things. So from the time you're born, you have this yoke. This heavy yoke is the burdens of life. This heavy yoke are the curses of Adam we read in Genesis 3 and 17. From the day you're born to the day you die. That's what we read, that the, the infirmity was made permanent. So that the even when you did good, the evil is still there. You can't break this yoke. I got the yoke around me. You got the yoke upon you. And it's a heavy yoke. When you deal with depression, sadness, anger, wrath, malice, sin, lust, folly, lewdness, idolatry. Because you got this yoke on you, man. You're still in slavery. But you're in slavery to your body, to these curses, to the flesh. Right? Their imagination of things to come and the day of death trouble their thoughts and cause fear of heart. These are the things we deal with, right? Worried about the unknown. What could befall us? Are we going to drive and get pulled over? Are we going to get fired from our so-called job? Is our woman going to go off and, and commit adultery? Am I going to walk and break my damn knee? Am I going to slip and fall? Am I going to die today? Is today my last day on the earth? Am I going to die in my sleep? Am I going to get that job? Do I have enough for my family? Are they going to be okay? What if I die today? What if, you know, these are the thoughts of man, right? These are the imagination of things to come. What about Jacob's trouble? Is the most high going to have mercy on me? Am I going to be saved? Have my works been enough? Am I really a man of the Lord? What if I don't, what, what, what happens if this? And all of this is the curse of Adam and the infirmity in this, man. This is hell. See, in the kingdom, you're not going to have to worry about what's going to happen next, man, because you'll be in peace. And a spirit is going to be inside of a body that's going to be perfect, right? So the ima their imagination of things to come and the day of death trouble their thoughts and cause fear of heart. From him that sitteth on the throne of glory unto him that is humble in earth and ashes. So everybody deal with this, man. Kings and slaves. From him that weareth purple and a crown unto him that is clothed with a linen frock. Wrath and envy. Trouble and unquietness, fear of death, and anger and strife, and in the night, it's like you, and in the time of rest upon his bed, his night sleep do change his knowledge. So even when you sleep, you don't get no damn rest, man. You got nightmares. I remember I had this so-called job uh, maybe like six years ago, and I had to work long, long hours. I mean, a long, I'm talking about long, long hours, right? Then I would, I, I, I would, uh, and I had to, I had a long commute, man. Huh? You know, I had to wake up two and a half hours early to get there, man. Huh? And two and a half hours pretty much to get back, you know? And I was working like 10 hours, you know? See, that, that was hell, you know? And I get back and I go to sleep. And I could finally go to sleep. I might have time to eat something, maybe do a lesson, you know, read, add a call, whatever. Just to go to sleep 
and dream about being at work at the plantation. We don't get no rest, man. How is that rest when you finally get to go to sleep and relax, but then you're dreaming about you being at work? You sweat, you labor, then you wake up, you gotta go right back to work. And that will happen all the time, man. And that still happens. That's hell. You don't get no rest, even in your dreams. People deal with nightmares, and you could be sleeping, you feel a damn demon on your chest, man. You had a long ass day catching hell, and you wake up. And you with damn sleep paralysis, man. You got to call on the name of the most high, the damn demon pressing you out. And, you know, hey, this ain't it, man. This is true hell. Verse six, a little or nothing is his rest. Yeah, you don't, you might get five. How many Jake's getting eight hours? He saw you got to get your eight hours of sleep a day. I don't think since I've been an adult, I've ever gotten eight hours of sleep. Who's getting eight hours of sleep? If you get eight hours of sleep, then you a, a all praise to the most high. Right? Look, man, I, I get five. Then even you can't even go to sleep because you're thinking about your mind start racing. And you worried about all this stuff you got to deal with, man. Then when you fall asleep, you got to get back up. You got to go to work or, you know, you might have had a nightmare or you got to use the bathroom or you might be sick and you wake up and you're coughing or, you know, you might have children, they cry. You got to deal with hell here, man. A little or nothing is his rest. And afterward, he is in his sleep as in a day of keeping watch, troubled in the vision of his heart as if he were escaped out of a battle. When all is safe, he awaketh and marveleth that the fear was nothing. Such things happen unto all flesh, both man and beast, and that is sevenfold more upon sinners. So we're dealing with these curses, man. We're in these bodies. Since Adam went off, every single one of us is catching hell. The infirmities has been made permanent. Job chapter 5 in verse 6, although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born unto trouble, as the sparks fly upward. Man is born unto trouble. You're born in a society where you might get killed, huh? especially an Israelite. You might not even, they say the number one death or the cause of death for an Israelite is being in your mother's womb. Because you might get aborted, your mother might smoke cigarettes, drunk, you get fetal alcohol syndrome, you come out and damn, you got three fingers and two toes, or you might get aborted. You're born into trouble. You don't even, you can't, you might not even make it out the womb, huh? Then as soon as you make it out the womb, you got the your, your damn Esau sticking you with all types of needles, man. I think these babies be crying when they come back on the earth, man. Because they know they're dealing with hell. You know? They eating all these damn, your mother, I remember my so-called uh, mother told me when I was a, 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 in her womb, she said she only ate two things. It was bacon and ice. It's about pork bacon. Yeah, she called me by my slave name. She said, yeah, you know, when you was a baby, I only, only ate two things. I had bacon and I had ice. Well, that's hell. Who wants to be in a mother's womb eating force-fed pork and ice all day? Just to come out and get jabbed up with all types of damn needles, man. Getting slapped on the on the on the butt by an Edomite, put in the damn uh cloth with a damn tight ass hat on, man. Get then you then you force fed Similac. You, 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 <laughs> this, this, is, this is crazy, man. Then the baby comes from the hospital. You're like, all right, I can finally get some rest. No, at the end of the day, if you see your mother heating up some damn Similac, then they take it in a spoon and they shove it in your damn mouth, man. She might leave you in a hot ass car. A lot of these babies die in the damn car, too, man. You know, they think they catch a break. They go into the store, they're like, oh, she go into the car uh, store to get me a car seat. 
Then she leave you in the damn car. You crying, let me out, let me out. Then you die at three months old because your mother went to the club or she left you and it was 95 degrees in the car and she forgot or she fell asleep and rolled over on you because she was drunk because she was out with rail and the girls all night. Man. You can't tell me that this isn't hell. It says, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Man. Right? Let's go to First Thessalonians. Right? It, man, this, this is a horrible life. Right? This is why Jake be depressed and you got PTSD and you can't function because you're just dealing with hell, man. Huh? This is the infirmities of the flesh. First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So we are appointed to deal with affliction. So that link up with Job, the fifth chapter, we're born into this, man. Right? So you can't get moved to leave this truth because of hell. You were created to go through hell. Right? This is the curses of Adam. This is the infirmities, the grain of evil seed that we have to deal with. Right? This is what we have to deal with through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. Let's go to 2nd Ezra. Chapter 7. Right? 2nd Ezra, chapter 7. Man. So again, we're looking to be delivered from all of this, man. Right. And, and we're looking for a spiritual body where peace and the kingdom of heaven is. We don't have to deal with all of this. Right? Second Ezra, chapter seven and ten. It reads, and I said, it is so, Lord. Then said he unto me, even so also is Israel's portion, because for their sakes, I made the world. And when Adam transgressed my statutes, then was decreed that now it was done. So when Adam went off, the most high made this world hell for us it's going to tell you that then were the entrances of this world made narrow full of sorrow and travail they are but few and evil full of perils and very painful this is a very painful life for the entrances of the elder world were wide and sure and brought immortal fruit yeah you're dealing with evil here man. Right? processed foods and you don't know what the hell you eat got a thousand ingredients in it you got fake rice, fake cabbage, hell arthritis, broken muscles, your feet hurt, your knees hurt, you can barely see, your damn, uh, you got glasses on and a cane by the age of 45, then you die. Somebody might shoot you, your own brother might shoot you because you're in the curses. And Edom might, might damn, you know, pull you over and shoot you in the back of the head when you reach for your wallet. This is hell. You don't know what the hell is going on in this society, man. So, again, we're, we're looking to be delivered from here. We're looking for Yahweh, Bashem Shai, to deliver us. Not, not just from America, but from these bodies. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 1. But we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So what it's saying is if this earthly house, which is your body, if this body were to decay and break down, which it happens to every man, your spirit has a spiritual house, a, a spiritual body that it goes to. So just because your body dies doesn't mean your spirit dies too. Your spirit goes to another habitation, right, in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. And that's the thoughts of the elect. The thoughts of the elect is not trying to make $10 million, not trying to keep America flourishing. If you're one of the elect, you're going to groan because you're in this hellish body. Because you're in a, a Paul called this body, who uh, the body of death. Who shall deliver me from the body of death, from the curses of Adam, from the uh, per, uh, permanent infirmity, from the grain of evil seed, we're groaning. Uh, for in this we groan, earnestly, eagerly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Meaning we want another body. 
I want to be in a body where we don't go off. I want to be in a body where I don't have nightmares, where my body doesn't ache. Where you can let the most high granted you to fly, to be in a chariot, where you can do whatever you want to do, man. And you can rule over these. That's what we want. Verse three. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up in life. So Paul is saying, look, we want a spiritual body. We're groaning in his body. And we don't want to just die and be in the spirit world. No, we want a spiritual body. We want to be clothed upon. We want our spirit, our spirit to be in a spiritual body, an immortal body. And we want mortality to be swallowed up. We don't want death to have dominion over us anymore. Right? We want death to be swallowed up. The same way Korah, Dathan, and Abraham were swallowed up. All right? So we're really, you know, looking to get out of here, man. Out of these prisons. The, uh, the Lord called this, these bodies prisons. Right? Let me get this in Isaiah 54. I believe that's what I want. Isaiah chapter 54. And if I can believe that's Isaiah. Let me get that real quick. Isaiah 51. All right, so lock here. Well, Isaiah 51 and 14, if I'm not mistaken. God, Isaiah 51 and 14. The captive exile hasten it that he may be loosed. They should not die in the pit nor that his bread should fail. So we're the captive exile. We're captive in these bodies. We were exiled from the third heaven. And we're hoping that we get loosed because we don't want to die. We don't want our spirits to be in this body and we just die. And then we're born back again on the earth. That's what a lot of these babies, when they're born, they look angry, man. You see these pictures, these babies be like this. They be... I've seen it, man. Oh my God. Come back. And they be like, God damn, I'm back. We we're sick of coming back on the earth in this hellish body, man. Right? We don't want to die in this pit anymore. Right? That's what the Lord said. We are saved by hope. Right? We are saved by hope. We're hoping the Lord has mercy on us. That's why we do the right works. Right? We do the works. Even though we know that we have evil in us, we have to do the work so the Most High can have mercy on us, man. So we can prove to the Most High that, yeah, we see the evil in us, but here's what I'm trying to do. Look at the effort I'm putting forth. Look at my hand to the plow. You see that I care. You see that I want this kingdom, Lord. A lot of people, I'm evil. I got an evil seed. I got a permanent infirmity in me. Yeah, it is what it is. I'll be wicked. And it is what it is. No, we're not like that. Man. Right? This Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation is really going into Israel. We are the creation. Yahweh is our creator. And right now we're vexed. We're groaning. We're upset, man. Even right now. We're traveling in pain, physical, emotional, mental pain. And not only they, but ourselves also, right? Which have the first fruit to the spirit, right? Meaning the people, the brothers in the truth. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So we're not waiting to make it in the society. We're not waiting for the big promotion. We're not waiting to find $10 million. We're not waiting to have 10,000 women. We're waiting for the adoption, for our body to be redeemed, to be glorified, so we can have the laws in our inward parts. So we don't have to hate our brother anymore. We don't have to feel envy. We don't have to lust. We don't have to sin. We don't want to sin. Who wants to sin, man? If, unless you're some demonic... Uh, uh, Reprobate, man. Or Edomite. It says, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And that's what it's all about, the redemption of our body. Because that's why we're in this, these curses in the first place. 
because we have sin in us. That's why we were in the wilderness going off because it's embedded in us. That's the root cause of it all. The physical infirmity is the root cause of why we're in the situation that we're in from the time of Adam all the way till now. So the main thing that we want to be delivered from is the root of why we're in captivity in these bodies. So we wait for the adoption to with the redemption of our body. But we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So we're hoping to have the bodies mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. Right? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of the Most High. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So that's the resurrection. Dead bodies coming out the grave, and if you're wicked, you're going to be destroyed. If you're righteous, you'll be in the chariot. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And we're looking to put on immortality. We don't want to put on YSL and Gucci and Prada and Louis. We want, we want to put on immortality. Right? So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And that's where that's the main enemy right there, death. Right? Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So since we break the law, we die. Right? That's what it's saying. As long as there's sin in us, it's going to bring forth death. But once that sin is removed, that infirmity is removed, then we won't taste death anymore and we will be immortal. And that's what we long for. Right? We long for the Most High to break the curse of Adam and to deliver us from these bodies. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3. And there should be no more curse, but the throne of the Most High and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. So in the kingdom of heaven, You'll finally be redeemed. You'll finally be in peace. You'll finally have rulership. And that evil seed is going to be surgically removed from you on a spiritual level. And it's going to be replaced with the laws and the commandments. And you'll be automatically righteous. Bro. You will be automatically righteous. So with that, we're going to close up. Giving, of course, our honor and our glory to Yahweh. By Shema Mashiach, Wama Lake most high willing you were edified. WFI late nights. Quam Yashal. Shalom.